So how would you analyze, since we were analyzing Trump and Hillary Clinton a bit, Bernie Sanders, right? I think of him as the kind of epitome of righteous anger. Yeah, I, I don't think that's unconscious. I think that's just what we call righteous anger. Okay, so that's healthy. You know, you know, as, a, as, a Jew, healthy. as a Jew, he's upset by the oppression of the Palestinians. Yeah. As an American, never, yeah. He, as, a, as an American, he's upset by the fact that millions of people don't have decent health care. His vision is limited, but sure. his but is genuine um, as far as his motivations are concerned. You've never seen him fly off the handle, or right. vilify, or be snide. He has a certain dignity and integrity to him when, when it, even at his most righteous, and he's pointing the finger. I mean, you've pointed this out, Katie, that the difference between Bernie's right. anger and Trump's anger, and they were both channeling adjacent or sometimes overlapping pools of resentment in the population but bernie would direct that anger I, again this is bernie during the campaigns i think sure. bernie now is a, is a different animal yeah. a tamed one but um but he would direct it towards where the power actually is yeah and trump would direct it towards the scapegoats towards but, the scapegoats right. and 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 leave people full of sort of more impotent rage as opposed to a kind of focused anger that that leads one to an imagination of other possibilities and that's what was so special about that moment where he, he was having people imagine a world that didn't exist rather than trying to get back to some fantasy of something that never happened in the first place how does capitalism create a toxic culture well people have certain needs i mean human beings evolved over millions of years and hundreds of thousands of years and so when you look at an acorn, as we give the example in the book, it'll grow into a mighty oak tree, but only if certain conditions are met. Human beings will also be their best selves, but only if certain conditions are met. Under certain conditions, the acorn will be a distorted little plant, or it might not thrive at all. Same with human beings. Now, a culture that there's an activist, uh, podcaster, author, uh, Tom Hartman, who says that a culture can be nourishing or toxic. And the example or the analogy that we use in the book is if you're a laboratory scientist growing organisms in a petri dish, if the microorganisms were thriving and proliferating, it's a healthy culture. If they're dying or getting sick or failing to reproduce, it's a toxic culture. Now, Capitalism's toxicity resides in the fact that its basic assumptions go against essential human needs. So an essential human need is for contact and communality. That's how we evolved, in small band groups connected to each other. Not Headline, to Gabor Mate says human beings genetically communist. Yeah, well, uh, communalist. Uh, communalist, yeah. Yeah, uh, we, we're meant to belong and connect and collaborate that's how we survive that's how we evolve that's part of our need we're meant to take care of each other any mammal has to take care of its young in certain ways that either promote or if not available undermine healthy development so the fundamental assumption about human beings under capitalism is that we're selfish greedy competitive aggressive each out for ourselves now if that's the ruling ideology that goes totally contrary to human needs. And that means we're going to bring up children who are shaped in that environment. So the schools encourage individual achievement and competition and evaluation. Do you meet the standards that we expect you to meet or do we accept you the way you are? Well, it's all about judgment, evaluation, fitting in with the social norm. Those go contrary to human needs. Human beings have a need for meaning and purpose in their lives. There was a <clears throat> study I just <coughs> read yesterday in France that it's only 20, 30 years ago, 85% of people said that work was important to them. No, it's 24%. Because work is no longer meaningful. Because what is it? It's all for big corporations far away doing meaningless work. So... When you have a society that undermines or doesn't meet essential human needs, you have a toxic society. 
not to mention the, the <clears throat> not to mention of course the economic inequality you can you can scale or study the more inequality rises in a society we're not yeah. even talking about fundamental income we're talking about okay. inequality inequality is a predictor of ill health right and, and even your perceived inequality right like you, yeah. you talked about how even when people who are doing relatively well if they feel like they're being uh surpassed by others or they're getting the short end of the stick yeah there's physical it undermines health so yeah. th there's multiple ways no we have to grant that under capitalism <clears throat> In the developed countries, which are developed largely at the expense of the so-called underdeveloped countries, we have to keep that in mind. But there's been terrific scientific and medical and technological achievements and all that, and sanitation and all that. You know, that's all true. Great but nonfiction it, books have been written. But again, you have to put it into the world context, and um, at the same time as that's true. The conditions that undermine real emotional health have been exacerbated over the decades. So right now, a lot more people are lonely, a lot more people are anxious, a lot more people are depressed, medicated than ever before. And this is in the richest country or societies that the world has ever known.